Well, this is the last talk of uh, this great conference. And it's a pleasure to introduce Paul Nelson, who will speak on moments and bounds for L functions of large degree. Yeah, thanks very much for the introduction. Uh, it's great to be here speaking at this conference and seeing so many of you in person again uh, after so long. So, um, yeah, so we'll be talking today about um, moments of L functions and bounds, emphasizing the large degree case, where I guess um, we'll set some notation that I think will maybe be uh, not too bad. So Q for us will be some large number thought of as going off to infinity. F will always be a family of automorphic forms where we'll assume that all of the analytic conductors are roughly of size Q. And we'll give maybe six examples throughout the talk of things like this. Uh, we'll write L of pi S or L of S pi for the L function. And we'll spend some time talking about integral moments. So K, like it usually does, will be the thing that appears in the exponent when we take the two kth moment. And occasionally when discussing the literature, I'll refer to the cuspidal variant of such a moment. And that'll always mean what you get by working with a cuspidal twist in a second moment where the cuspidal twist is on GLK and is fixed. So if you take sigma instead to be an Eisenstein series, you would recover the two kth moment. That's what we mean by that. All right, any questions on the notation? Uh, it should be two. So think of sigma as being like an Eisenstein series and then. Let's allow twists so that we can move away from the second one. Put the twist into the family. Okay. So um, a heuristic that we've seen in many talks, this conference in particular, the most recent one by Phi, is that if you want to study the 2K moment, well, you need to understand, for example, sums like this that you get by opening the approximate functional equation. And you can do that or you're at least expected to be able to do that most easily if, well, well, first of all, the family should be kind of reasonably complete. You should have things like nice trace formulas you can write down for it. There should be sufficiently many harmonics, whatever that really means. And then I guess you need the family to be a fair bit bigger than the range of the parameters that you are considering. And this kind of condition, as we saw in the last talk, is enough to detect the diagonal condition in favorable situations and give you a pretty simple sum to analyze. Um, whereas, so I guess that condition picks out the range of exponents where 2k goes up to four times this logarithmic ratio alpha. And um, yeah, I'll refer in subsequent slides to the range where you have an, an inequality, a weak inequality, allowing equality here um, as the primary range. So this is the range where we typically hope to be able to say something rigorous about moments of L functions. So when you have a quality here, it's exactly when you first start seeing off diagonal terms appear in sums like this, where you might expect to have to solve a shifted convolution problem or something like that. And beyond that, things tend to get much more difficult. Okay, so, so now come a slew of examples, um, which will give us some practice with the notation. So, so Henrique will consider the zeta function now at points between Q and 2Q. So the family size is Q, which is the first power of the conductor. And so the primary range goes up to four. And this is, as we've seen in many talks, work of Hardy Littlewood and Ingham going back quite a ways. So of course, if one wants to estimate larger moments, exactly as we saw in the last talk, one could try enlarging the family somewhat. So, Instead of working with just you know um, a single modulus and all the Dirichlet characters modulo that, you could vary the modulus as well in some dyadic range, and maybe allow t also to vary in some, some short window. So so here the family size is roughly q squared in some sense, and um, I guess that makes the primary range going up to eight. And as we saw in the last talk, there have been some rigorous results on these moment asymptotics. Um, I guess with an exponential weighting rather than a truncation to t at most one, as I've indicated here, but roughly of this flavor by Conrad Ivanich and Sander Arjun, and then Shandi and Lee 
treating the sixth and eighth moments. I mean, here I'll just remark that it's if one doesn't obtain like a power savings, so it's somewhat less satisfactory than say for Ingham's results, but one can at least save a logarithm in these sorts of results. Okay, so um, there, there are also some results involving GL2 modular forms that were mentioned in the last talk, where maybe you not only take all forms of a given level in Nebentipus, but maybe you average over the Nebentipus as well. And as Fi remarked in the questions at the end of the last talk, you could, you could further try averaging over the modulus. And that'll get you families where the, the primary range goes up to something like the 10th moment. So, I mean, as people have known for a while, you can make the primary range quite a bit bigger by going to automorphic forms on higher rank groups. So I'll, I'll start with this example. We'll kind of do a bunch of examples of families that'll get kind of successively smaller. And I'll try to summarize what we know about moments for them, which, which isn't so much, but you know, maybe it's starting to improve a bit. So let's consider the family. Um, yeah, for this talk, I'll, I'll take everything of level one, but for most of what I say, there will be some level aspect analog that one could consider. So I'll look at cuspidal automorphic representations of GLD of level one, where I don't do anything about the central character that's allowed to be arbitrary, but I ask that the analytic conductor, so this product of numbers appearing in the functional equation, be of size Q, the same parameter from the first slide. So in this case, the family size is roughly Q to the D. So the primary range becomes, well, 2K up to about 4D. All right, so you see that as D starts getting bigger and bigger, um, 4D gets bigger as well. So at least in principle, according to this heuristic, that if you have sufficiently complete families and you have a sufficiently low degree moment, there are plenty of examples here of families of L functions for which maybe there's no good reason why we can't compute something like the 28th moment and see some astronomical coefficient come out like in these random matrix theory predictions. Um, so I, mean, I think this is a pretty fertile um, area to try to probe some of these conjectures further because it, it might conceivably be amenable to rigorous analysis. We might be able to study um, some of these other conjectures involving secondary main terms rigorously in situations unlike with the, Z with the zeta function where we don't exactly know what to predict. So in general, this is kind of like a, I think, wide open area to look at, like increasing degree moments of L functions of larger degree. So is this a difficult problem? Um, well, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll say what we know about it. But for instance, for this family in particular, I don't think anything has been done beyond the case of the degrees two, where um, the eighth moment is very similar in spirit to a, an another paper of Shandy and Lee, the one on special points uh, for GL2. And I guess the equal one is, the, is, is Ingham's theorem, as we've already seen. So it would, it would, it would be, in particular, um, this result here is, is only known with a logarithmic savings. And, and I think it's a particularly attractive problem to try to improve that to a power savings. That would give, for example, a new proof, hopefully, of some of the hardest cases of subconvexity for GL2 that we only know how to get with a, with a fourth moment over a short family. Having a new proof of that would be, I think, really interesting, as well as doing anything when D is at least three. Okay, so any questions on that? Um, I've called this the conductor family. I might refer back to that later. Okay, yeah. Your conductor, I mean, the analytic conductor, there's no T aspect. Well, well you're allowed, allowed to, to twist, twist these things because the central character isn't fixed. So it contains variation. So it's important pi in this particular Yeah, it's part of pi. Yeah. So pi will have n, n parameters. And if you translate them all simultaneously, that's the same as replacing the argument of the L function by its translate. So, so the, the switching gamma factors would be taken from the into account? Yeah, I've, yeah I've, I've allowed them to be built into the band. Okay, so, so the next smallest family you can consider is maybe something similar, but you fix the central character of pi. So for example, we could fix it to be trivial. So that's the same as working on PGLD, but still require the conductor to be in a dyadic range. So I mean here, the, the family size drops down in the exponent by one. It's now something like Q to the D minus one. 
The primary range because it comes, as I've indicated, up to four quantity D minus one. And I mean, just to put things in context, so I'm not exactly sure in like the full history for this fourth moment for biggish families on GL2, there might be some earlier work, but this is certainly treated by Michelle Venkatesh in kind of greater generality, adelically with, with level as well. Um, and it's, it's their main tool for proving subconvex bounds for, for GL2. Um, and I mean, just to give some kind of basic benchmark of like what we know relative to what we might hope to know. So if we take D to be larger, but we take 2K, this exponent to be much smaller than what it conceivably could be. So, so I guess 2D and 4D minus one, these numbers agree exactly when D is equal to two, but as soon as D is three, they start diverging. This one grows quite a bit faster. So here there's a result from my, my former PhD student, um, Subha Jajana, that gives an asymptotic formula for this kind of moment, but for the cuspidal variant where you, as on the first slide, replace the high power with a cuspidal twist. And it's using a method very similar, or I mean, I guess generalized to GLN from what Michelle and Mekadesh did. So this is kind of a, a baseline. You can do the 2D moment for PGLD in the conductor family. Um, can we do anything bigger, anything closer to say four D minus one? That's, that, that's an open question. That if, I mean, Subhajit can do 2D, can you do then the smaller values? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think one would expect that using an integral representation that would be maybe a little more technical at kind of first to get one's hands, hands on, but should just, the problems should be simpler. Yeah, I think. But it hasn't, that hasn't been done either. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. So, so if there are other questions on this, um, Let's shrink the family a little further. So let's consider what I'll call dyadic families. And I'll, I'll take some time to go through this slide. So we'll again, relax the central character condition. We'll take everything on GLD and we'll require that the D parameters showing up in the functional equation. So I've written the, the arc medium factor here. L infinity consists of shifted products of gamma factors where I'll call the shifts mu J. I just normalize them so that if, it's, if it comes from a MOS form, the mu j are real. That's what this factor achieves. So maybe this is a decouple of say real numbers or well, it can be more general than that. And we ask that they belong in the dilate by some large parameter T of some fixed compact set. And I'll assume that this compact set avoids all the hyperplanes or anything vanishes. So we're asking that all of, the, all of these D numbers kind of grow and at, at, at the same rate, and that they lie in dyadic windows. That's the situation we're describing here. Okay, so in that case, the conductor is again roughly t to the d. The family size grows like t to the d plus one choose two, which is something like the d plus one over two power of the conductor. So the primary range becomes up to about two d plus one. You know, so for example, if d is, um, say two, this would be a sixth moment of a dyadic family on GL2. Um, this is, I guess, I, I don't know if this has been considered in the literature, I'm not, I don't think it has. Um, so in any event, um, I mean, but yeah, the one result that I think we have for general D for these kinds of families is something in a, in a paper uh, I wrote with Akshay Venkatesh a few years ago that concerns kind of the endpoint case where the exponent is as big as you'd hope um, but it's for, it's for the cuspidal variant of the problem, first of all. So not taking a high power, but instead taking a cuspidal twist. And secondly, uh, we're passing through a compact quotient. So rather than working with GLD automorphic forms, we're working with things on some anisotropic unitary group or orthogonal group. And in that case, we get an ineffective estimate for, I guess, you know, you know the analog of the second moment of that kind of family um, matching up there. And the proof uses... Um, Ratner theory, that's the source of the ineffectivity. And, you know, even for example, when D is equal to three, I think it's completely open to give some effective treatment of this moment. So that would be an eighth moment for a dyadic family on GL3. Yeah. So when you say, and all these different um, references that you're giving for all these different cases, when you say it's done, do you mean a uh, little on average upper bound, or do you mean an asymptotic formula as the parameters go to? Yeah, that's a good question. For all these, I mean an asymptotic formula. 
and, and, and I've kind of indicated in places when it is not with a power savings. So the, so the shiny leaf theorems give a logarithmic savings, and this one gives an, a little low of one savings, but the others have all been power savings. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other questions? Okay, so on the next slide, we'll start talking about short families, and we'll see there that that, that kind of a bit more is known, um, like effect, effectively. So that there's this general principle that kind of shows up in GL2 analysis, where if you can do something for a short family for the kind of threshold moment, then you can probably also do it for a longer family. And that principle, so far, as far as we can see, hasn't persisted in, in, in higher rank, or we just haven't developed the technique that we need to be able to, to do that. So um, yeah, continuing, let's talk a little bit about short families. So I'll have in mind now, all pi on GLD, no central character restriction. Let's ask that each of the parameters lies in some fairly short window. So for example, you could take T1 through Td to all be of size T and well-spaced. So each of their differences also of size roughly T. And maybe delta you should think of as something like one, but in practice, we'll take it to be something like a small fixed power of, of T. Um, I mean, I put this part in parentheses here just because it's, it's not really necessary. There's a more complicated family one could write down without assuming this condition on the T, Tj's for which the results I'm describing would, would hold. Um, but it, it's kind of described naturally in terms of the polynomial whose roots are the mu j over t. If you write down what this condition says in terms of the coefficients of that polynomial, you'll get a, you'll get a definition that doesn't require this parenthetical. OK, so then I guess the conductor for all of these is roughly t to the d again. The family size is now t to the d times d minus one. Uh, okay, I should have divided that exponent by two in all of these places, like on the last slide. So these should all be d choose two. And then the primary range, as I've indicated correctly here, is now up to twice d minus one. So it's very natural to ask whether one could evaluate a moment like that over a short family. That's kind of the, the threshold moment. Yeah. Yeah, assuming that it's better. Uh, a well spaced, so it would so you are not covering things that are multiplicity like powers of the function. So I'm, I'm not. I mean, I'm assuming that just to make the formulation of the slide a bit simpler. But for example, if you allow two of them to be the same, and let's say d is two, you would write down the same definition of a family, but you take delta to be roughly t to the half. And then the family size would stay the same, and everything I'm saying would apply to. You want to take delta equal to zero. Yeah, and multiplicity of, 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 of. Well, in that case, the family could be empty. I mean, we can't even prove a vial law through the family. So. Uh, what is mu sub j? Can you recall? Yeah, mu j is the number that shows up in the functional equation. Yeah. Right here. So that the, the shifts in the gammas. Yep. So I'm putting those in intervals. I mean, I mean I'm not asking that they be equal to something. Subject to phase off. And this this shift. Yeah, I think one can show that these are, yeah. They should these should satisfy a lot of law, right? The mu j's. Okay. It is not. If you're on GL3, I think what Henrik is asking, because yeah. uh, he's moving to, if you're on GL3 and you looked at the lifted guys, you wouldn't be able to touch those. No, exactly. Yeah. But that, but he's, but, so he's assuming square, that you have many of them uh, and they're not lying on, on us. On guys where the coefficients, one of them might be zero. Uh, at least. In, in cases where it's been proved, I don't know, we'll see. I mean, you can formulate it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, yeah, so the, I guess the essential condition is that all the TJs be of size T. This condition is not really necessary, it just simplifies the, the formulation. Okay. So the kind of thing that we can um, maybe first study 
is not the sum of the L function itself to the 2d minus first power, but maybe, for example, the sort of thing that shows up when you open it using the approximate functional equation, bound the root number by one, and focused on, focus on the dyadic ranges closest to the critical dyadic range of square root of the conductor. That's what I've indicated here. So um, yeah, so here there is quite some history. So, so Henrik, so, so Ivanich studied exactly this um, when d is equal to two. And um, so as I've indicated here, by inserting an amplifier, so as Henrik kind of introduced there, one can um, deduce a subconvex bound for, for the L function itself from these sorts of estimates. So if one's interested primarily in bounding L functions, these are kind of natural sums to look at because it suffices to bound these things. So bounding moments of these partial sums becomes a natural thing to track. So when D is three, um, these sorts of things were studied by Blomer and Bootkin, who, who again get an asymptotic formula for such partial sums amplified over, over the short families as I've indicated. So, so, so more recently, so I guess this is when their paper appeared, but it maybe came out as a preprint in uh, early 2015. Um, so I give something like this for general D, but um, well, okay, it's in, a, it's, in a, it's in a slightly different language. So, uh, so I mean, one won't see sums exactly like this appear in the paper, but as I'll explain in the talk, something equivalent to this is, is what's done. Um, and so as indicated here, um, this implies subconvex bounds for these things. So I'll, I'll say in the next slide, um, something about what bounds one gets because many people um, told me they wanted to hear about that here. I'll spend a little bit of time explaining the proof of this. And then I'll say something at the end of the talk about the outlook for trying to actually estimate moments like that. Yeah. To be precise and equal to two, you should also mention Ilyuk and uh, this so, is your old sub. So this is in mind here. Your t t plus one. No, but I mean amplification. I, uh, I don't method know of amplification. Here. Anyway, yeah. I think this is your Krela paper. It's referred. I don't want to apologize to my co-authors. <laughs> Wait, sorry. What should I? Have? Okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm definitely not giving a survey on like the whole subconvexity problem and all ways it's been considered, but. I mean, for this particular family, that's the paper that I thought was the, the relevant one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's the. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'll <pass> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Take the second next bounds on the next slide just for, for reference. So, so for pi on GLD, say of level one, there's a, there's a more general statement um, for general level. So, provided that all of the mu j's are of size t, we get a bound that saves on the convexity bound by the exponent um, one over 12d to the fifth, which is small but positive. And so, just as, as, as a corollary, you could, you could treat, for example, the t aspect for standard L functions. So L of pi one half plus I T is bounded by uh, the small improvement over the um, convexity bound. I'm, and, I'm sorry, what is the M, the dependence on M on the upper bound? The dependence on, oh, sorry, N should be D. N should be? D. Okay. Usually I use N for these kinds of talks, but I'm doing Dirichlet series approximate functional equations. So I need the, okay. the master place and yeah. Okay, thanks. Yep. Okay, so um, yeah, so like I said, I'm gonna spend a little time because people asked me to, to like say something about the proof of, well, this estimate, which is responsible for these kinds of things. This will also just give like an excuse to say something about how one can try to study moments of L functions using integral representations, which is kind of a largely unexplored thing, um, you know, especially playing with Eisenstein series. And yeah, then I'll, I'll say something about moments of L functions at the very, very end. So the main tool for saying anything rigorous about L functions, so you know, for proving that they're analytic and that they have functional equations, uh, this all eventually boils down to studying their inner representations, which involves a pair of automorphic forms 
on a pair of groups. So for example, we could take, I'll take pi to be on GLD plus one. So this is shifting by one we had before. And now let, let's take another automorphic representation sigma on the general linear group one rank smaller, say GLD. And we'll work with a pair of automorphic forms. I'll call them V and U inside pi and sigma respectively. So V is some function on GLD plus one of R on GLD plus one of Z. U is a function on the same quotient, but D with D instead of D plus one. And um, pi and sigma signify that these functions satisfy some eigenfunction conditions under the um, center of the universal developing algebra and the heck, heck algebra. That's the kind of setup we have. So then the basic output of this theory of inner representations is that you can write the L function up to a proportionality factor as an integral of the automorphic forms where the proportionality factor is given by some local integral of Whitaker functions. So you can imagine trying to use an identity like this to maybe estimate some moments of L functions, uh, you know, either varying um, pi or varying sigma. And um, one of the ways to try to do that is to, well, first use an identity like this to establish all of the standard analytic properties of an L function, write down an approximate functional equation, expand everything in terms of coefficients, and then apply your favorite trace formula like the Kuznetsov sub formula. There's, there's another way that um, you know, many people have kind of contributed to where you just study the inner representation directly and maybe apply something like a Parseval relation or something like a um, pre-trace formula to carry out the average over pi and sigma. So there's this old paper by Peter Sarnak on fourth moments of zeta. There's the, um, the work of say Bernstein and Reznikov that kind of really clarified how we should think about these things. And I guess Michelle and Bekatesh's work is also kind of in this sphere. So in order to carry that out, you gotta understand a couple of things in this equation. You gotta understand the integrals of automorphic forms as well as the integrals of Whitaker functions. And you need to do this for sufficiently many or sufficiently interesting choices of vectors. So what we'll try to explain next is like, one approach to choosing vectors usefully. Um, and then we'll talk about how we can apply it to these things. And Ian, you had a question? Does the pre-trace formula come up in Michelle Bankovich? Well, not directly, but you can you can see it that way if you'd like. I mean, you can think of the parsable identity as like a degenerate case of the pre-trace formula if you really want. Yeah. Um, yeah. Other questions? Okay, so, so I wanted to say a word about like how one can use micro-localized vectors as in my paper with um, actually Venkatesh that I mentioned a few slides ago to cook up useful integral representations for these kinds of things. So let's take pi as on the previous slide. So something on, like, I guess I bumped the rank down by one, but that's okay. Um, I mean, more generally, this is a local question. So we can talk about any irreducible unitary representation of GLD over the reals. Okay, well, I'll refer to its parameters. Maybe, maybe I'll pretend that pi comes from a MOS form. So these parameters are all real. Let's say it's tempered. So these are D real numbers. And we'll define the cohesion orbit of pi to be, I mean, this is, this is, I guess, an approximate definition, but it's good enough for our purposes. The space of D by D matrices with real entries whose eigenvalues are the parameters of the L function. This is some concrete collection of um, matrices it's typically a conjugacy class. So, I mean, really we should actually specialize to the regular matrices inside this collection, the ones whose minimal polynomial is the same as their characteristic polynomial, then it actually is a conjugacy class under the conjugation action of GLD of the reals. So, so this set controls many things about the representation pi. So for example, there's something called the Kirillov formula that expresses the character of pi in terms of this set as, as something like a Fourier integral. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go into that um, direction for this talk. The perspective I'll focus on again instead is that to elements of this cohesion orbit, th there's a reasonable way to assign vectors, or I mean, more precisely, classes of vectors that satisfy a microlocalization condition with respect to the parameter tau. So let's take some time to unpack this. So, so tau here, I, I didn't write it, but Tau we should think of as an element of this conjugacy class or cohesion orbit whose size is comparable to T. And we'll ask that the vector be an approximate eigenfunction under group elements 
that are kind of within roughly t to the negative half or a bit smaller from the identity. And the eigenvalue for this action should be described by the matrix tau in this form. So we should take e to the two pi i trace of x tau and then multiply that by the vector. This should spit back the vector you, uh, that multiple of the vector you started with. So just focusing on this line for the second, I mean, there's, so how can we think about this? I, I think informally the idea is you could say, let's imagine that our vector, when we move it under the group action, we can look at the orbit map for that action. Let's imagine this vector has frequency T in some sense, meaning it doesn't move much on scales much shorter than T. So in other words, you can think of the vector's derivatives under the orbit map as being bounded by roughly T. So, you know, in that case, well, let's think about that. Elements of the group um, of size little o of T inverse, much smaller than this, would act trivially on the vector. And so what that tells you is that these elements of size a bit smaller than T to the negative half, well, commutators of such elements will act trivially on your vector. So you have something like an abelian action of such group elements of, of, of this size, t to the negative half, on the vectors you're considering of frequency at most t. When you have an abelian action, you can try diagonalizing it. So everything's kind of approximate here, but that's the rough idea. And you, you, can, make, you can make this precise. And um, there's a reasonable notion introduced in, in, in my paper with, with Venkatesh that kind of captures the spirit of, of this condition. Where, I mean, rather than working with vectors, we'll work with certain operators that project onto them and make rigorous statements about those that kind of shadow the heuristic statement I'm trying to suggest here about the vectors. Okay, so that's this line. Um, this next line is just the observation that elements of the group G that are, that are not too big, say within a fixed compact neighborhood of the identity, will act on vectors satisfying this condition and map them to vectors satisfying the corresponding condition where you translate tau by the same group element. So in other words, this condition is kind of obviously functorial. If you move the vector and you move tau by the same group element, it doesn't change. Um, where the action on tau will be by, by conjugation. So if you apply that observation to something in the centralizer of tau, you see that these vectors don't change when you move them by elements of that centralizer. So you can try diagonalizing the action further under elements of that centralizer. And it turns out that when you do so, these vectors are again automatically eigenvectors with the eigenvector described by the same relation. So what I've written here is the same is true when X is just little o of one, provided that it centralizes tau. So that's saying that this condition holds for elements X of X that we should think of as kind of small elements of the centralizer. So we have some, some nice family of conditions on our vectors that we can, um, we can write down. And so it turns out that these conditions kind of morally characterize the vector and also to some precision characterize the representation. So these conditions are kind of like asking that of the vector transform by some character of a group. Yeah, Ian, you have a question. So are you calling the micro localization of V at tau is like the orbit of V under this neighborhood of exponential? No, I'm saying that V is micro localized at tau if it satisfies this kind of condition. Yeah, sure. So in other words, I got trying to mimic the V algebra action. Yeah, you can think of it that way. I mean, you could even express it in terms of the Lie algebra action and then integrate at the end to say something on the group level. Okay. So you can write down an integral operator that kind of enforces these conditions. So namely, you take the function on the group that's supported on the set of elements that are acting in either of these conditions. So things that are either within roughly t to the negative half of the identity or that centralize tau and are kind of close to the identity and define something like a projection operator onto the class of vectors that satisfy this condition. So the, the projection would just be, so it would be supported where I said, and it would take values given by the inverse of this eigenvalue here. And then that would kind of project onto vectors satisfying this sort of condition. And there are many rigorous senses in which 
these operators that you get behave as if they were rank roughly one idempotent project projectors. So, so for example, in our paper, we prove composition formulas that say that if you compose two of these operators, you get a third operator that kind of is of roughly similar shape, which is kind of a shadow of the fact that if it were literally an idempotent projector, it would square to itself. And um, also, also its trace, for example, is roughly one, or maybe grows like a very, very, very small power of t when we write things down precisely. Um, and finally, the family that you could attach to tau consisting of all representations for which these operators are non-negligible is a short family exactly in the sense of a couple of slides ago when we talked about short families. So using, using some precise form of this, of this discussion, you have, um, you have these notions. And yeah, one other thing we, we study is what these local zeta integrals that we mentioned behave like when the vectors that we plug into them are micro-localized. So I've stated here um, kind of informally what we show that if you have two vectors that are micro-localized, um, so this is the setting of this slide here where we have V on the bigger group and U on the smaller group, then, Okay, say, say, say the one in the bigger group is micro-localized at a parameter tau, whose upper left submatrix I'll call, I'll call tau zero, and the one in the small group at some parameter that I'll call eta. Then we show that these local zeta integrals are roughly zero unless the sum of the kind of restricted parameter and the parameter in the smaller group is roughly zero, in which case it has some size that we can understand. So something that I've written here, um, it'll be t to the negative d squared over four, provided the vectors are unit vectors. And to be totally honest here, we need to do we need to introduce a short averaging over families of microlocalized vectors. But insofar as we're being precise about what those are, this is kind of a faithful representation of what of what is shown. So the other thing that I just wanted to remark quickly is that. I mean, this condition very naturally suggests looking at the set of all parameters, say C in O pi, whose restriction has negative lying in O sigma. Those are the kind of ones for which you could hope to choose eta so that this holds like exactly. And in th this set we, you know, we study and um, in favorable cases, it's, um, it behaves very simply under the action of GLD. So it's a, it's, it's a torsor for GLD, meaning GLD acts transitively on it and with no stabilizer. So, so, so kind of any two points you would choose that satisfy this condition will be equivalent under GLD. Um, and there's kind of no additional symmetry that you get from that action. Okay, so then, yeah, the, the example that I wanted to um, illustrate where you could kind of use this instruction to write down using integral representations, something concerning moments of L functions is as follows. So let's say we're given a short family that I'll call F, consisting of pi's as before on the bigger group, PGLD plus one, and um, sigma on the smaller group, GLD. We'll choose tau following the recipe of the previous slide, something kind of of size T, and satisfying the, the, the indicated conditions with respect to the cohesion orbits. So then F, our family will be roughly the family attached to tau. It'll consist of the pi's for which the corresponding integral operator is non-negligible. And then let's write V pi and U sigma for the corresponding micro-localized vectors. So then we can define this, um, this automorphic kernel function that I've called K of X, Y, that you get by summing over integral points of PGLD plus one. The, you take the integral operator and you write down this expression. This is the kind of expression that one always encounters anytime one does any average over automorphic forms, whether it's a trace formula, a Kuznetsov formula, or whatever else. So this will be literally equal to, I've kind of pretended that there's only a discrete spectrum and just written the sum, but okay. Um, some sum over pi's and a sum over an orthonormal basis for pi of that operator applied to the vectors in that basis is indicated here. And applying the heuristic for these operators that we indicated on the previous slide, we get um, 
a sum that kind of collapses to just our family, the short family that I called F. Um, and moreover, the sum over vectors collapses to more or less individual vectors in that family. So if you integrate a relation like this against the other localized vector that you called U, then you get a pretty um, reasonable integral representation of a moment of a family of L functions. And I mean, I think this, this general idea of writing down integral moments of L functions using recipes like this goes back you know, very long. So I mean, I remember papers by, for example, Diakonu, Garrett, and Goldfeld in the early 2000s that wrote down lots of identities kind of like this and studied things like how to regularize them, how to make sense of them. So I mean, I think that maybe the new feature here is, is the systematic approach to choosing vectors in terms of cohesion orbits, evaluating these relative or the, these local zeta integrals, um, and uh, studying the orbit structure on the, the locus of the condition um, indicated here. So, so the result of that is that we can kind of write down pretty, pretty arbitrary families, weighted families in terms of vectors by integral representations like this. Um, yeah. Could you remind us what the co-adjoint orbit is in the setup that you just given us? Yeah, it's, it's the set of, so for pi, it'll be the set of d by d, d plus one by d plus one matrices, whose eigenvalues are the parameters. Yeah, assuming, assuming they come from mass forms, let's say. And then same for sigma, so. Um, I mean, it's, it's maybe worth pointing out that like, when I say often here, this, this condition rules out the conductor dropping cases that are kind of infamous in the subject. So those are usually infamous for global reasons, but even for local reasons, they're kind of problematic, at least in, 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 in some of these uh, discussions. Can you remind me what yeah. omega tau is in the kernel function? Yeah, sure. So omega tau is the thing that projects onto vectors satisfying these conditions. So it'll be supported on group elements that are like, I guess, generated by things of the form x of x, where x is like this, or x of x, where x is like this. Yeah, so it'll be kind of fat in the direction of the centralizer and then thin in other directions. Okay, and I mean, I've, I've kind of singled out just this family just because it's the one that is relevant for like the theorem that I was gonna explain the proof of in a bit. But I mean, one could do something similar for any, say, GLM times GLN integral representation and um, I mean, you know, for example, this problem will then maybe become underdetermined and we'll have more flexibility, but one can certainly write down nice integral representations now for any moment of L functions over any reasonable family. That's kind of a, a doable thing. And then the remaining challenge is to actually analyze what you get when you write, write such things down. Okay. Yeah, so I'll say something about, um, how you get like actual moments that way. So I've, I've already kind of preempted it at the beginning. You can of course take one of the two factors to be an Eisenstein series. So I've indicated here, let's take Sigma S to be the space of Eisenstein series with parameter indexed by some D tuple of complex numbers, S1 through SD. So in that case, it's, it's well known that the rankin selberg L function is actually a shifted product of standard L functions. So S equals zero, the way I've normalized it would be the central point. And as kind of a refinement of this construction of vectors that I mentioned a few slides ago, we, we can actually do that construction kind of reasonably well in families. This is one thing that comes up in my most recent paper. So we can, we can find families of vectors, say US and Sigma S, so that provided S is not too big, let's, let's think of S being in some kind of fixed neighborhood of the origin these local integrals involving a microlocalized vector for pi, and again, a microlocalized vector for sigma s, will first of all detect that pi is in the family of interest. And then, okay, there will be this fudge factor t to the negative d squared over four. And then there's this factor uh, q to the trace of s over two. So trace of s is just the sum of the entries of s. This is the kind of fa factor that shows up, for example, if you want to write down the functional equation for say a Dirichlet L function symmetrically. You always put a leading factor of Q to the S over two out in front, and then the functional equation relates S to one minus S. So here Q is, the, Q is always the analytic conductor or something approximately that of the L functions. So this is kind of a nice, this turns out to be the right way to construct these vectors for when you want to um, do the analysis I'll describe. 
And yeah, so I guess then with this choice, if we define the wave packet Eisenstein series, so, so roughly you will be like a contour integral of the US's where we'll put in a smooth weight function that has the effect of morally truncating the integral to bounded size. So think of something maybe entire, but of rapid decay in vertical strips. Then this integral here involving V and U, I guess if you unfold this integral carefully, you'll see that it's morally a proxy for something like what you get from an approximate functional equation, but focusing only on the data ranges. So these are the actual expressions that I'll, that I'll bound in my paper, and I'll, I'll say something about how to bound them. I guess the advantage of this, of this average is that, well, U is now a rapidly decaying function on the quotient of GLD. So you don't have to think about, you know, Eisenstein series growing at cusps. You can, you can use things like Cauchy shorts effectively. Um, so everything in my argument will converge absolutely because of this step kind of at the beginning in much the same way that when people write papers using the approximate functional equation, that first step gives them finite sums that remain finite typically for the paper. So yeah, summarizing what we have so far, something like this sum up to some normalization factor, which is something like a proxy for the 2D moment of a standard L function on GLD plus one, has this kind of geometric expansion in terms of integrals over the quotient of GLD of, I guess, our wave packet Eisenstein series that I called U, and um, our integral operator omega tau, averaged in the way we've indicated. So we need, to, we need to asymptotically evaluate this because we eventually want to actually amplify it to get a non-trivial bound. And so there's kind of like, uh, you can see from unfolding very quickly that the elements in the smaller group contribute some kind of apparent main term that you can make smaller by amplification. So I'll say something about how to estimate um, these remaining things. I think I have, I have, I have 13 minutes, okay. So um, I'll say a little bit about how to estimate these kinds of things. So um, there may be two main inputs. There's some, oh, okay, there's, there's some linear algebraic fact concerning tau, one of the two parts of this whole system here. And there's another fact, which is a local L2 growth bound for U that um, kind of controls in, a, in, 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 in I think a non-obvious way how U grows near the non-compact parts of this quotient. So you avoid the trace formulas by using the integral representation. I mean, you can call this a trace formula because a trace formula is what you get by integrating a, the spectral expansion of an automorphic kernel and doing something with it. Um, or maybe that's not what a trace formula is, but okay. Um, Use the pre-trace formula. Yeah, yeah, sure. Something like that. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Okay. So yeah, I'll say kind of first like the core result that in my analysis this boils down to. Um, in fact, maybe it's not worth like stating it in detail, but it's some explicit linear algebra lemma that I'd like to mention because I hope that somebody will pose this to their freshman linear algebra class as a bonus problem and somebody will find a better proof than I did. Um, <laughs> but that hasn't happened yet. So um, challenge remains. Um, it just says that if you have an N by N, or so let's say a D plus one by D plus one matrix, I'll call the upper left D by D block tau zero. And if, those, if that block in the original matrix have no eigenvalues in common, then there's a certain linear equation that has no solution. So the linear equation is that if you take a centralized, an element of, if you take a D plus one dimensional matrix that centralizes tau, but not for the obvious reason that it's central. And if you take Z to be, say, let's say Z is the matrix with ones on the diagonal, except in the final entry, there's a zero. So it's a central element of the D plus, the, the D dimensional matrices then you can't have a commutator relation like this. Um, so I, I don't expect anyone to parse this and like solve it on the spot, but um, I, mean, I mean, the proof that I came up with uses what? It expresses the resultant detecting the, whose non-vanishing detects this condition 
as a determinant of a matrix formed by generators of the centralizers of tau and g and, in, and tau zero in h. And um, yeah, um, okay. So this implies something um, about varieties in the group when you exponentiate it and you kind of use the fundamental theorem of calculus or the implicit function theorem in some way. So again, it's a kind of complicated statement. Um, so this is something that Simon Marshall also worked on some years ago in a piatic context and under some slightly different conditions um, and obtained maybe, maybe slightly different results. Um, so it says that if G is an element of the centralizer in the group of tau, then the varieties that you get by moving tau under this coset of the center and the group, subgroup H should kind of meet transversally um, in the way I pictured it here. So H tau here is the equator and G Z tau is this blue thing. So in the case of the, in the, case of the picture here, it's just the observation that if you rotate the equator, then it meets itself transversally. Um, in the general case, it, I mean, it, I think there's no escaping that this assertion as I've written it here boils down to this linear, linear algebra lemma because you can convince yourself that if the linear algebra lemma failed, then you could exponentiate that failure to a failure of the, uh, of the group lemma. And then one thing you get out of this is some kind of bilinear forms estimate that I've indicated here where, so H is the smaller group, U1 and U2 are L2 functions on H. So without looking at these conditions, this identity here is, is, is as you can see, a bilinear forms estimate. So I've, it's expressed in terms of the L2 norms of U1 and U2. Um, and I guess without the exponent a quarter, what I've written would be best possible assuming nothing on U1 and U2. But if you assume these two further conditions that you have some kind of invariance of let's say U2 under small elements of the centralizer of the smaller group, and if you assume that the group element G is not too close to H, even modulo the center, then you can get a savings here um, by this exponent a quarter. And the analysis of that savings is basically, okay, you apply this theorem from linear algebra that the spectral radius of the matrix is bounded by the largest row sum, and then it reduces to the, the transversality observation on the previous slide. So that's the kind of um, analysis that goes into um, establishing this bilinear forms estimate. To actually apply that to um, this um, off-diagonal contribution from gamma not in GLDZ, but from the bigger group, since we're dealing with a non-compact quotient, we're gonna have a lot of unipotent elements that contribute to this. And we're gonna to have to kind of count those non-trivially. So this is a feature that comes from the non-compactness. And to compensate for that growing number of unipotents, what we need is some control on how our Eisenstein series grows in a local L2 sense. So I've indicated here, H is again GLDR, gamma H is GL, GLDZ. We have this decomposition into Ziegel domains where we can write group, ele we, we can write elements of the quotient as dominant diagonal matrices times elements, let, let's say X of, of some fixed compact set that I've called omega. This is the dominance condition. Um, Bahar measure is then expressed in these coordinates by dividing by the modulus character. And if we normalize our Eisenstein series so that the L2 norm is one, what we end up needing and what we end up proving more or less is that this ratio here is bounded by a bit smaller than one. And, and the way to think of this is that the L2 normalization implies that the left-hand side is bounded by one, whereas the right-hand side, as soon as A is kind of not a scalar matrix or, or, or even not the identity matrix, this will be a bit smaller. So A1 will be big, and so A1 inverse will be small, or AB will be small, and so the minimum will again be small. Um, and, and this, I think it's fair to say, comes out of some kind of rankin solberg type analysis using um, maybe what you call incomplete mirabolic eisenstein series. And you can imagine trying to bound um, such expressions in terms of rankin solberg type integrals involving U and then analyzing them. That's kind of how the argument starts. So, okay, I've just written that here. This is a mirabolic type Eisenstein series. You integrate it against U. You bound expressions like this from above in terms of expressions like below. And then you do some analysis there that takes, takes some time. One crucial observation that actually kind of delayed my completing this for like many months is that you can make use of the inverse transpose automorphism of the group to take 
estimates that apply in one range, so, so, so namely, I guess the first estimate involving A1 inverse and translating them to the other range. And this, I think, in some sense is kind of a shadow of using the functional equation at the level of approximate functional equations. So um, that's all I wanted to say about that. And then I just wanted to end by saying that like one can also hope, and I hope to have more done on this um, before the presentation, but what can we do? You can hope to study moments this way. So rather than taking a 2D power, you could imagine taking a bunch of shifted copies of these things. So say S1 through SD, T1 through TD. I put the right normalization under front. You have another integral representation kind of of similar spirit where now you integrate against actual Eisenstein series rather than wave packets. Um, in practice, it's healthy, I think, probably to form wave packets inside and then integrate over um, translations of those wave packets outside to make everything converge. But this is kind of roughly what you get. And um, I guess the recipe that we've seen discussed so much throughout this conference suggests that you should expect the main term involving all of these products, so these are products of degree d squared, where the numbers alpha and beta j showing up in the products are all the permutations of the numbers si and tj. So it's pretty easy to see that the, that the group elements that in the kind of dominant dyadic case were responsible for the main term do not produce anything like these L functions. So the main term has to come from somewhere else. So, so what I'll describe here is kind of ongoing joint work now with uh, Liang Yang, Yang. And also I had an email discussion with uh, Masayo Suzuki a few months ago, basically about this point. Um, so there, there, there'll be no theorems here, it'll just be kind of like food for thought. Um, so rather than summing over the subgroup GLDZ, you could sum over the mirabolic subgroup, which is a bit bigger or the opposite mirabolic subgroup. And using a bit of Poisson summation, you can see that these things contribute two of the main terms that you'd expect from the recipe. The ones where you either take the trivial permutation of the SIs and the TJs, or you take the complete swap of all the SIs with all the TJs. So that, that I guess addresses the case where you're taking um, a second moment where you expect only two terms from the recipe. For any higher moment, you need to find other main terms somewhere, and they can't come from the mirror ball. So that's kind of the, the next challenge. I mean, I mean, I kind of expect that the remaining contribution will come from matrices that I've written like this in block diagonal or in block form. So A is D by D. The key condition I think is that C inverse, sorry, C A inverse B. So that inverse is kind of affixed to A somehow. Um, this should vanish but B and C should not vanish. Um, maybe intrinsically, this is the kind of collection of matrices whose orbit under, under left and right action by GLD can accumulate near the identity element. So it's a very natural class to consider. Um, and and a, a typical example of such a matrix is the one I've indicated here when D is two. Like, I, I guess you could take, you can always take the upper left thing to be identity. And then the key condition is that the two, uh, column and row vectors that fill out the matrix should be orthogonal to each other. That's the condition that we're looking at here. So for example, um, something we checked pretty recently is let's say, let's say D is two. Let's look at a typical main term not accounted for by the mirabolic contributions above. So this is what you get by doing some swap, but not like a complete swap in the recipe. So you can actually kind of piece out where this comes from, from analysis of these, um, these uh, gammas, it'll come from looking at the contribution first of, first you focus only on the constant term for the Eisenstein series, which will then have some zeta factors showing up just from the usual formulas for constant terms. Those will give the first two right there. And the remaining will come from some local integral that I haven't seen before that you get by unfolding the contribution of this matrix and doing some local analysis. Um, so I think it's a very interesting question to see like how more fully the unfolding of this geometric expression that I've written down interacts with the recipe. Um, but, and, and in fact, I mean, our, like our preliminary analysis certainly shows some features in common with uh, Zeig's talk yesterday where you see these kind of products over I and J up to some bound appearing in a preliminary expression that eventually goes to the recipe that you wouldn't actually see in the recipe. So I think there's um, a lot of interesting things to kind of pursue further, there's gotta be some really cool structure that one can tease out of this analysis that I haven't yet even glimpsed. Um, 
So I hope many people will be interested in talking about such things. And I think I end with just like a slide summarizing some of the proof ingredients that went into the main thing I tried to explain. Um, and with that, it's, it's, end, it's over. So I guess I'll thank you guys for your attention. And also it's on the last talk. So I got to thank um, the organizers and all the speakers and everyone. So thank you. <clears throat>
but even in like a, a finite place in depth aspect, there's there's no hope of doing. Oh, okay. So, so to that. no. So what I'm saying here, like like Archimedean and depth aspects end up being pretty similar for these sorts of questions. So like so it's like a, like a, but a direction that like does not immediately follow is would be like the horizontal direction where you take level p where p is a prime going up to infinity. Then I mean even for GL two and GL three, the results we have they use different kind of techniques. So yeah. Thank you. Yep. Any more questions? So just stick around after we clap. I have a little story to tell, and Peter wants to say a few words. Peter Sarnak. So let's thank this. Person.